everybody. This is uh, Dr. Arun Deer, and I am extremely delighted to have a very special guest uh, with me today. Uh, and he's none other than Dr. John Martini, who has uh, not only attained fame because of this movie, The Secret, where he was starred, but more importantly, for the profound work that he's doing. I can read a lot about his uh, achievements and also how he's touching lives of millions of people across the globe. But if I can just share this, that when I had read all of this about him, I think it was not enough to kind of do service to what work he has done as what I actually experienced when I actually attended his breakthrough experience, which was a completely, I should say, heart opening. I shouldn't even use the word mind blowing because it wasn't indeed mind blowing, but it was heart opening. And I think it has given true insights personally to myself and has allowed me to view life and the challenges that life throws in a different way. So without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. D. Martini, who's currently coming in from Dublin. Thank you so much for sparing this time for us, uh, Dr. D. Martini. I really do appreciate this. Well, I can thank you because there was a bit of a glitch on our timing and we're, we got it all figured out now. Thank you. Uh, that's all right. So uh, I won't go into the details of your achievements, but I might probably dive straight in because I've got some burning questions that our audience has sent in. And uh, I want to begin by asking you, you are uh, a medical practitioner, as in you started your career as a chiropractor, and then you transitioned into uh, theology and, uh, you know, into teaching and research. Can you tell us something about what was that journey that you took from medical practice into uh, what you do now? Well, actually, I started my teaching career when I was 18. And I taught all the way through my educational years, including in professional school. Um, so I was teaching right from the beginning. It has been, been my dream since I was 17 to, to do that, to teach and to travel the world and be a healer also. So by the time I was in professional school, uh, I was studying in chiropractic, spinal and neurological conditions. I um, had taught my way through school. That's how I paid my way through school. And that's how I taught every single night. And many times I taught the classes that in the school. I was blessed to place out of the classes and teach the classes that I was taking. And so that was my journey. Uh, when I got out of school, I opened up a practice and I started with a little 970 square foot office, a small practice. And it was partly a research clinic because I was taking records of all the patient data as I was doing it. Cause I was more interested in etiology unknown and solving problems and things. And then within 18 months, I had a 5,000 square foot clinic with five doctors and 12 staff members. So I grew very rapidly and I delegated a lot and I did research and I mainly started lecturing uh, I was lecturing literally every night almost, and sometimes during the day, and I started lecturing in around the different community, and then the city, and the state, and the nation, and then around the world. Now I've been in 150 countries, uh, and I've spoken in many of these countries on various topics, but health is where I started. But I realized that our health professions were needing more than just clinical information. They needed business information, personal development information in order to them to achieve what they wanted to achieve. And then I realized that the, the health profession is limited and I, I started to utilize some of the same information to other industries. And today I get the opportunity to, to speak to every imaginable industry. Uh, I mean, I could speak to a university, like I'm speaking to Trinity University tomorrow in the afternoon, I'm speaking in Cardiff, Wales in the morning uh, mm. to business leaders. In the afternoon, I'm speaking to the academics. So every day is different, but I, I spoke and I bring healing and, and uh, that information sometimes, but also healing of businesses and healing of social issues. Um, I've, I've allowed myself to be a healer in, in more broader perspectives also. Because as I understand that beyond a certain point, the challenges that are being faced in say one particular industry versus another start to kind of blend in. The challenges are more uniform, if I understand yes. this. Point. Well, every, everybody, many of the challenges they have are perceptual. And that's one thing that I'm, I'm, uh, I developed quite a bit of skill in, in, in helping people transform their perceptions, decisions, and actions in life so they can change their reality and, and, and the outcomes they have in life. And I think that's the, 
the thing that was helping me in the health profession. And also, because I had the opportunity to meet some of the really amazing healers on the planet. I, I worked with Dr. Denton Cooley, who was a cardiovascular surgeon at the Texas Heart Institute. And he, I got to do rounds with him. I got to, to study with him. And I, and I watched a, an amazing healer. He was working still into his 90s. And an amazing healer. Hmm. Um, and I learned a lot about the healing arts and the, and the psychology of the healing arts, uh, how presence makes a difference and how certainty makes a difference and, and how your confidence uh, plays a role and the placebo effect and the, and the objective information. And, and I learned a lot about the healing arts and, and I, that was really helpful because I realized that, that you're, you're, you can be a great clinician and you can know a lot of academics, but you still have a personal interrelationship with the patient. And that's another factor. And sometimes that's overlooked. And sometimes doctors don't have that bedside manner, but that's a part of the healing process. And, and I watched him, who was a master, um, his skill levels at that were astonishing. And I watched what he did. And, and no, very few people in cardiovascular surgery could compete with him because of it. And not, right. not because of the procedures, but because of the way he handled people. And I that's saw that that was part of it. And I wanted to specialize in that too. Yeah. And that's what I was just wanting to get your insights on, you know, after traveling so much, after dealing with people with different kind of, you know, psychological issues, and I'm sure all of these manifest in different forms. What is the pattern, the uniform pattern that you've started to observe that you feel that this is this pattern sets up an individual for a failure, whether it is in health. And I know you mentioned about the seven areas of a individual's personality. Uh, so just uh, what, what sort of patterns have you observed so far, Dr. Martini? Well, um, every human being lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life. And they're based on their experiences and on the judgments that they've accumulated and the biases and the perceptions that they've accumulated. And these set of values determines what they perceive, what they decide, and how they act. And whatever's highest on a person's values, they're spontaneously inspired to act. And whatever's low on the values, they need motivation extrinsically to act. So a person who's living congruently and in alignment with what they value most excels, expands, uh, awakens their executive center, is more inspired in vision, more strategic in planning, more executing with diligence, and has more self-governance and therefore more masterful in what they do. And a person is trying to go and do something that's low on their values where they procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate and don't have spontaneity. Uh, they can't possibly compete with that because they're basically trying to, they need motivation to keep them going. And finding that out, what it does is it allows them to be more objective, more resilient, more adaptable, less distressed. And they're able to go on and adapt. And as you know, stress is the inability to adapt to a changing environment. When they're doing something that they love doing and they're inspired by it, they're way more adaptive and they have more use stress and more wellness factors. And their cardiovascular, their immune system, their digestive systems, their microbiomes, everything is enhanced and normalized when they're doing something that they really love to do compared to people when they feel deontological and they feel like they're forced to have to do something every day and need motivation all the time. And they're fighting themselves all the time and they create distress and they are more vulnerable to subjective biases, which distort the sensory systems, which then distort the autonomics, which then distort the epigenetics, which then create symptoms in cell physiology. So our body is a feedback mechanism guiding us back to the most authentic self living by our highest values. And we have misinterpreted that. But I see people that really grasp that, take command of their well-being, instead of dissociating it and blaming things on the outside and looking for outside solutions. Yeah. And I think there is plenty of now research, which is proving that, you know, they did a good study on breast cancer patients and breast cancer with depression has got almost two and a half times the risk of recurrence with breast cancer with a healthy mental well-being. But I, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm not even, I'm not even going to, uh, I, I've, I've had debates because I was once the president of the Cancer Prevention Control Association in Houston, Texas, back in 1979. Okay, so I was involved with the mind-body work back in then. And I, I had oncologists at first fight with me about this. They said, well, the psychology has nothing to do with breast cancer or cancer. 
And I started correlating the Gansers and I found out when women do not feel that they're able to nurture or feel nurtured and they have fantasies about how life is supposed to be and it's not matching their fantasies and they feel like they're not getting what they want, they have a higher probability of having uh, the breast cancer. There was no doubt about it. We saw that over and over again. And, it, and there were people fighting it because they didn't want to believe that because it, it wasn't a pharmaceutical thing. It wasn't a, a, the magic molecular approach. And, and they didn't realize that the, yeah. the molecular approach is psychologically correlated. If you, if you have perceived more challenge and support and your autonomics are skewed to the sympathetic side, you're changing your neurotransmitters, neurochemistry, hormones. Things are changing right off the spot. So if you look at those and think, well, it's just hormonal imbalance or transmitter imbalance, and you try to compensate for it, you're missing the correlation of the psychology and what's in the mind to create it. And so I, I watched that, and I uh, did a presentation in 1979 to a 1,000 oncologists on the correlations of cancers that I had seen, and it was well-received. I, I was surprised at the conference, but individually people were fighting um, the, the new paradigm because their paradigm was not psychology. Right. And probably the, the evidence wasn't there too. The level one evidence that they are looking for, which only comes with time. Well, they weren't, they weren't even looking for it at, at the time. Correct. I remember I had, a, uh, there was a Epstein, uh, Samuel Epstein, who was involved in ecological. Epstein and Epstein bar virus. Epstein. I, he was in my class. I, I wow. sat and, and spoke to him. Okay. He was in my class. I read every book that he had had on the time and he was right there in the class. Mm -hmm. And this guy was an icon because he was trying to change water and, and pollution and was trying to change the world's understanding of what was toxic and causing cancers too. And uh, he was there nodding his head, just going, yeah, finally somebody's speaking out about it. <laughs> young, I was 24 at the time. And I was like a young whippersnapper. Uh, I, I commend you for having the courage at 24 to speak in front of all these sort of oh, uh, I was, I was, oncologists. I read every book in Houston, Texas on oncology before that talk, because I didn't want to look like a fool. I made sure I was up to date. And I, um, I devoured those books uh, to try to make sure that I, I was up to date with the most inf you know, pertinent information. But I came in from an evolution or biological mechanism. Yeah. One thing that I feel certain about is that there is, you know, we have a portion of our genes are bacterial, a portion of our genome is, is viral. Uh, and there's a whole series of what was once called junk DNA, there's non-regulatory DNA that's sitting inside the cell mm -hmm. and the genome that comes active under stress and reactivates. And so when we get under high stress situations, we reactivate some of these older genome components and change the, through transpositions and, and retrotranspositions and move, movements of deletions, duplications and, and epigenetically induced Epigenetic, changes. Correct. We are literally changing the gene expression and can create aneuploidies and create some of the neo uh, growth processes there. So. I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, that, that stress is definitely underlying some of these because I've seen patterns of behavior and I've seen absolutisms in cancer patients with black and white viewpoints. Yeah. You'll hear them say, well, I would never do that. Uh, my mother was always mean and they're very black and white thinking. And very I see these, you mean? these are non-resilient states that these cancer patients have that are leading to some of these illnesses yeah. and they're being overlooked. Yeah. And there's also chemical involvements in there and there's, there's, traumas that have never been processed that have been that are still sitting there festering inside people's minds so it'd be a hard time convince me that so, i watched the lady i watched a lady who had uh, uh, uterine cancer they removed her uterus they took out her ovaries uh, that had metastasized in the small intestine liver and uh, they started the chemotherapy and it was gone down uh, quite a bit it was really good making progress and i worked for six hours on all of her resentments to her husband resentments to um, her church, resentments to these people in her life. We cleared six hours worth of resentments. And she had about a 98% removal of all loci for cancer in her body. And then all of a sudden she found out, because she, she thought her husband was, was uh, or the husband thought that she might die. So he was not able to work and had an aneurysm and had to, he had to rely on somebody. He had no way of yes. surviving. So yes. he got a backup girlfriend in the meantime while the wife was going through chemo. Wow. just to make sure that he wasn't left in the dark because <laughs> it wiped out their cash. Well, he, all of a sudden she found out that he was having an affair. Oh my when God. When she found out that she was having an affair, the f she gave up. Wow. And the following day, her, her, it metastasized all over the place. I mean, literally the next day it started, it started metastasizing and she went downhill 
And the doctor said, we're going to have to do now radiation therapy. And they overrated it and singed it and occluded the intestines. And then they had to do resection. And then she just went downhill and she, I watched her destroy herself because she gave up. And yeah. the nurses could see it. The doctors ignored it. The doctor said, no, what it did is it adapted to the, the mixture of chemo, chemo that we did. This happens sometimes. They were completely oblivious to the psychological component. Didn't even right. want to hear about the idea that she just found out her husband's having an affair and she gave up in her attitude. Yeah. And that affects the immune system and depressions. So there's no doubt in my mind that psychology is playing a role in that. Yeah. Maybe it's not complete. There's other factors, but we don't want to ignore that component. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, Dr. Martin, you really answered my question because I was about to ask you, how can this method that you have invented, the Demartini method, which I have had an experience of firsthand uh, about, you know, whatever challenges you're having in your life, how do you look at the bright side of it and how do you look at the, how it is actually supporting you? Uh, can you just me, maybe perhaps just for the benefit of our audience, give a little specific instance for someone who's got a new diagnosis of cancer, what can they take? Uh, of course, short of doing the, the breakthrough experience themselves with you, what can they take to kind of start applying today so that they start looking at the challenge from a slightly different perspective? Well, I, I wrote a textbook, which is about a thousand health conditions and the psychology of it, which I present every, every few years to a group of health professionals. Um, so it depends on the cancer because the cancer, the, you know, when you go through developmental um, evolution, you might say, you start out with a zygote, you go to eventually morula, blastula, gastralization, and you got organogenesis, you get differentiation of cells, et cetera. At each stage, you can have what is called an initiator, then a promoter, and then a compounder, which is an initial event that can be emotionally charged, that then can be promoted by secondary things that remind you of the charge, and then compounded by other things that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. And these things can occur even in, in gestation. So these are not necessarily things that are induced after birth. This is something that can go on there and induce a tagging, a, a methyl or a acetyl tagging on the genome. And these things are now vulnerable and they're insults that haven't been resolved. And, you know, they used to think babies are born with blank slates. That's not true. They, we can see stresses going on in the womb yeah. in ultrasounds. Yeah. So these things are actually affecting the physiology. So what I do is I go in there and I ask questions and, I, and I'm based on the type of tissue and based on the, where the, the aggressiveness and, you know, the more aggressive it is, the more, the more we're going back in time, mm. uh, kind of a decapitulation back in time and the less aggressive, it's more advanced. So that gives me a time frame of where these insults might be, in their perceptions. It's all perceptual. Correct. And then what we do is if, if we, if we can trace it down, I literally have a chart, a, kind of an embryological chart and a timeline chart that initiates questions based on, on things because a congenital anomaly usually, if, it's, if something happens and initiates it, a teratogen or a psychogen, then what happens is the, the other areas of the body that's developing at the same time usually have a symptom. So right. we have, if you have a, for instance, you have a congenital block vertebra in the neck, you could have a horseshoe kidney because it's the same time in gestation. And so yeah. what I do is I try to find the insults and find other symptoms in the body that correlate time-wise and narrow down a time and then go digging into the psychology of those time frames. Mm -hmm. I also try to go and find out the benefits that the cancer is being used for, because there's no one will continue to do something without a benefit. And I ask them, what are the benefits of getting out of cancer? Well, it's bringing their family together. It's making them get out of a job that they don't want to do. It's making them get affection from people that have been distant. It's making them finally get their even family resolving. Back. Yeah, maybe resolving those unresolved matters. That's exactly it. And, and I see these patterns and people many times have tears of gratitude when they finally come a realization and they have to go, they actually say, is it possible that I've created this? And I go, you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen right. it. I mean, I've, I've, there's no doubt in my mind, there's psychological components. That is so true. And you know what, Dr. Martini, working in, in the mainstream medical system, I see this almost on a consistent basis that people are coming to the hospital for a diagnosis firstly, because it's always a challenge to do so many investigations. Some of them, as you may appreciate, are quite invasive to do a diagnosis, to take a biopsy. And once you have the diagnosis, they helplessly surrender to the system that give me chemotherapy, do surgery, whatever it is, get it out because they're looking for something outside, which is really a helpless state sometimes. It's disempowering. I want to give people their power back. 
Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place because there's people that are helped sure. by that. Absolutely. They don't yeah. But I would rather do them simultaneous. I'd rather do it simultaneous. In Tehran, I worked with an oncologist there and I was trying to incorporate that into their oncology units to be able to say, let's pull the people out and let's work on their psychology simultaneous. And let's do, you know, 20 people doing the psychology, 20 people not doing it and see what uh, ratios are, are different. And so these are the kind of studies that also at MD Anderson that we try to initiate that. But we got ran into a lot of politics because there's a pharmaceutical company that That's runs right. that. And they, they don't <laughs> and want really... stuff like that. They want it to be a pharmaceutical matter. But, right. but the point is that, that if, if a person can reduce stress, the Demartini method will reduce the distress. It'll change the perception, reduce the stress levels, help the immune system, change autonomic function, change microbiome without a doubt, Yes. initiate different behaviors in the way they eat because they're instead of eating to living to eat, they're eating to live, uh, start prioritizing their life. So they're doing things that are meaningful, their body rallies. And, and we, we have used stress, which is more wellness promoting. And our immune system is now considered like the seventh sense. The immune system is not considered this thing attacking germs. That's the immune true. system, wildlife management system. That's looking at the ratios of various organisms yes. and giving feedback the brain to be able to regulate that to get the maximum amount of use out of those organisms because we're symbiotes we're working correct. together correct correct and i think you did mention that there is a university in japan that you're working with to sort of assess the actual or quantify the effect of the demartini method on individuals who have gone through severe grief and trauma yes what we did is we um, i had the opportunity when the christ church earthquake occurred a number of years ago they asked me to come in and bring some of my facilitators in and we we helped with, in the town's hall we brought a bunch of people and dissolved a lot of the grief and then we ended up going to the tsunami location at ishinomaki in japan after the tsunami in 2011 hmm. and then we end up about a year ago we end up doing the one in in um in another place in near nagasaki on the earthquake and so right. the government asked us to come in and bring in there and we we cleared people literally in a day we worked on these people and cleared it awesome. and so the university one of the professors there said we want to see what you're doing and how you're doing it so they did two pilots on it so far we've got a hundred percent rate around a uh, hundred percent accurate rate on it wow. every person has got the result and it's a lasting result so i've been doing it since 1984 i've done it 3573 times now yeah. deaths i've taken through the grief process wow. and it's a powerful science so I can, it, yeah, I can tell you, yeah, my, my personal experience of the Demartini experience itself was very, it's a very powerful, very profound exercise. It actually opens up your heart to so many things that are lying in a very subtle way, as you very correctly said, unresolved. We've well, just you, put saw layers the over there. There. you saw the lady that we did the grief process and the breakthrough over the weekend, and she was there on Tuesday night. You saw her on Tuesday night or Monday exactly. night. Exactly. And there she was, and she was like, she, she can't experience grief because we dissolved it. Absolutely. I figured out the solution to what is grief, and we now have a solution. There's no human being that has to live more than three hours again, yeah. ever again with grief. Yeah. I now have a science on how to dissolve it. And, and the, the, it used to be thought that you have to have grief and you need to get over it to help you heal. Wrong. Grief actually causes health problems because it's, so you're holding on to a fantasy and you're having withdrawal symptoms from a fantasy and you're calling it grief. And that yeah. is not healthy. Yeah. But isn't it sometimes very hard to just give up because that is being used as a protective mechanism. It's like almost a part of their personality. It's like asking someone to completely, you know, remove your mask and wear something completely different. Well, that is sometimes some people have hidden agendas, and unconscious motives to hold on to it. I had a lady that had a son, a 16 year old son that hung himself, oh uh, came home and her son was dead hanging. And uh, the girl was freaking out and crying, didn't know what to do. And the, the mother was supposedly showing grief. But when we got down to it, working with her, I worked him from 11 a.m. to 4, 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, trying to work with it. Because I found out that she wasn't actually just storing the grief about her, her son. She actually married her into a rich family. And if she didn't have the son to grieve, the rich family would get rid of her because they thought the mother and father of the son said, she's beneath you. You married underneath your standard. And the right. parents didn't want her, didn't run around. So she, if she didn't show grief, now that she has no son, mm -hmm. they would divorce her and get rid of her. And she would lose her status. So she had to show grief, prolong grief, yes. and chronic grief in order to hold on to the status. And so we confronted that and dissolved all that. And then the actual grief for the son was minimal because she said, well, he's been doing drugs. He's driving me crazy. I'm afraid he's going to get us in trouble with the police. 
Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm about at my end's wit. Sometimes I want to choke the kid. Yeah. That was the truth. Yes. She's putting on this facade of grief because right. she had an unconscious motive. It's a protective mechanism that they were coming up with. Exactly. Because it was serving them. Uh, Dr. Demartini, can I say it's always uh, a delight speaking to you. I've uh, listened to so many of your videos and can I share this with you that we are in the process of in the university hospital where I work, we are in the process of launching a program called Change Your Cancer Story. And that is a 12 step process which totally focuses on this whole mind body connection going from, you know, the, uh, as a part of the program, there is a person who does grief counseling. There is someone who does mindfulness meditation and I bring in my signs from yoga and now from the Demartini method, what elements I bring. And of course the gut health, which has been an area of my sort of, you know, uh, subject of, uh, which is very close to my heart. So we are kind of blending it together and uh, we are commencing this program from next month onwards. And I'm really excited about it because this Demartini uh, breakthrough experience that I did with you was very timely so that I could bring elements of that to serve the people that are so helpless sometimes. Well, maybe, maybe you can help come in and do the training on the method so you really master it so I can, and we can put it in there. We can put that as part of the method in there. Absolutely. But I'm certain that will help them. I'm yeah, absolutely, absolutely certain will help them. Because I think cancer is one issue which is only growing in numbers and people look at outside for help Whereas they need someone, uh, you know, someone with expertise like yourself to show them how to unlock this power within themselves. So true. So true. It's got to, yeah. you got to give yourself that you, you, you're you giving away your power instead of claiming your power. Exactly. And the, the, I always say that the power that made the body is what heals the body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final parting words, Dr. Demartini for the audience uh, who are seeking help who, and wellness in, in, in their, their lives? Well, there's a thing, you know, the study of physiology is one of the most amazing studies on earth. It's to study how living organisms and cells and tissues and systems of the body work is extraordinary. Mm. But even greater than that is applied physiology. It's one thing to think of a physiology gone wrong as pathology. It's another thing to use physiology with application and applying it, for instance, if we know that we have a sympathetic response, we know the sympathetic nervous system creates a norepinephrine, epinephrine, and cortisol. And we trace those to receptor sites on cells and see how they circulate to the system to various cells. Each of those cells respond according to it with that transmitter through kinase or phosphatase enzyme pathways and cascades and second messengers. And they affect the genome and the histones through epigenetics. We can trace down what's going on and what the symptom is by the perception that they start with. And that area is the area that I've been fascinated by and deserves to be respected and used more because then you're giving power back to the person. You're doing it with a non-invasive approach. You're not doing something with a gamble with the chemistry and you're actually allowing the body do its magnificence with some coordination in a level of intelligence and understanding that we as doctors still don't know. Absolutely. That's what I'd love to see. The applied physiology honored and respected and evolutionary biology applied with it. Those two are very powerful systems in the healing arts for the future. Absolutely. And as I've come to understand this, it's like knowledge alone is not power. Knowledge that is applied is power. And, and that's precisely, uh, you know, what, what you have said. Dr. Martini, thank you from the core of my heart for sharing this wealth of information, which truly has the power to transform our lives. If we take it to heart and as you said, apply it because I think that that's where the rubber meets the road. And uh, I want to thank you so much for the great work that you're doing to help people all across the globe. And we look forward to seeing you again in, in Australia. I thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Martini. Once again, thank you. safe travels. Thank you. Yes.